Welcome everybody to another one of my podcasts and employee advocacy seems to be the um, flavour of the day, the month, the week, uh, whatever. Um, it's nothing new, it's been around for for a while, uh, certainly probably 10 years or so really I guess in some shape or uh, some shape or form and organisations in the B2B space are now starting to wake up to the fact that the new world order of marketing isn't what it used to be, um, it's certainly not, uh, it doesn't work as well. Um, we don't buy into the big corporate message necessarily. Everybody's saying the same thing out there online, wherever wherever it is, that we're all the greatest, we're all the best, we're all number one, blah, 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 blah. And we're now looking at to how we can activate the voice of the employee to be, dare I say it, more authentic. And that's the key word in all of this is authenticity, authentic, be real, etc. So if we look at the uh, uh, definition of employee advocacy, and uh, there's a lady called Margaret Rouse who writes for whatis.com as part of Tech Target. And I think we've got a very nice definition here. So I'm literally going to read it uh, verbatim. These aren't my own words. These are of... Um, uh, of Margaret, uh, contributed, contributed by Ivy Wigmore, I should add. Uh, employee advocacy is the promotion of an organization by its staff members. A business may ask employees to actively promote the organization, often through social media, as an element of their jobs. However, the most compelling employee advocacy consists of a freely offered communications on the part of the workforce, and we'll come back to that. The question of whether or not staff members are likely to freely promote an organization is highly related to the degree of employee engagement. We'll come back to that. In the workplace, employee engagement is largely a factor of the corporate culture, and we'll come back to that. And the employer's ability to make working for them a positive experience. So, uh, three things there for me. Um, it's freely offered communications, employee engagement, and uh, corporate, uh, corporate culture. So there's research out there which says that if you activate the brand of an organization, your reach can be as much as 500% increase organically versus the, the corporate page. And what, what we mean by that, or rather I should say what is meant by that, is if, you, if you're a corporate, the chances are you will have a corporate page on LinkedIn uh, run by your comms team or your social media team marketing whatever depending on the size of the organization you may well have a corporate Twitter feed and content will be posted um, again dependent on sector organization some of it may be pretty vanilla some of it uh, could well be all sorts of different things it could be any number of updates it could be promotions it could be acquisitions it could be CSR related stuff it could be but it's all pretty vanilla and it's in a single stream, if you will, uh, across the corporate, uh, the corporate page, which people may follow passively. And if you listen to my previous podcast on um, uh, influencer or stop being an influencer, the, certainly on LinkedIn, the changes in the algorithm may well dictate that some of your followers will never ever see your content anyway from the corporate page because they're not engaging. So the platform just takes it out of their, uh, their news feed because it thinks it's not interesting. But the point I'm trying to make is that typically we follow a corporate page, we don't really necessarily engage or start a conversation with it because it's just kind of the faceless corporate page. However, on social, across all social media platforms, kind of the, the purpose of them, uh, certainly initially, maybe not so much now, uh, is to start conversations, is to bring people to close together, share stuff, share interesting information within which you think your close sphere of network will find um, interesting or in uh, insightful. And that is where you can kind of ascertain your the difference in terms of your potential reach. So if we take LinkedIn, because it's easy, easier to do this way, go to your corporate page and look at how many followers you have on that corporate page. Um, then look at how many employees you have who are on LinkedIn times that number so the number of employees that you have by 500 because LinkedIn says that typically most people have on average 500 connections so it's a bit of a rough and ready calculation this but you get the gist of what I'm trying to do uh, that will then give you your total potential reach in the first degree versus uh, 
followers. So let's say that you have uh, a thousand um, followers on your uh, uh, your corporate page, and you have I don't know 200 employees um, that you work with. So do 200 times by 500 equals 100,000. So a thousand people following your corporate page, 200 employees with 500 connections, 100,000. Um, people you can reach that way so you can already see the delta is you know is 10 times as no, 100 times as uh, um, 100 times as big now of course they'll be crossover and duplicate duplicate relationships um, but you get the sense of what I mean if you are able to activate the network of uh, your employees and you can get into one more new connection or one more new connection of a connection of a connection and so on through their network that is far more powerful than just a single stream of consciousness coming out of the um, uh, the corporate page which as I said may not even be being seen because of the way the changes in the um, uh, changes in the algorithm so this is where the difficulty or I suppose the challenge of organization starts coming because you've got to answer the what's in it for me why should I share this onto my LinkedIn profile or even my Twitter profile? All right, those are probably going to be the two platforms that um, we're referring to. What's in it for me? Why should I share this? Why should I promote uh, the company uh, information on my LinkedIn profile? Um, my network's not going to find that interesting uh, and so on and so forth. Which then comes into the employee engagement piece because if that's, if that's the immediate reaction, then there's no point you even starting to try and drive an employee advocacy program if there isn't the employee engagement to do this in the uh, in the first place and this is why all too often when working with clients do we see these types of ideas these programs stutter fail because that hasn't necessarily been articulated to the individual it's been foisted upon them. Um, probably an employee advocacy tool has been uh, invested in, and I'll touch on that in a minute. And email communication goes out. This is what we're doing. This is what we expect of you. Just, uh, just do it. If behaviorally the individual doesn't understand how to leverage social in the first place, and if from an employee engagement perspective they do not see the value in why they should do this, then they're never going to do it which means you can't uh, start to uh, activate the voice of your um, uh, your organization. And I think this is this is always an interesting one, especially around things like uh, LGBT, gender pay, diversity, CSR, all this kind of stuff. Because, yes, of course, organizations at the top have to say that they are tackling this, they do this, they're an open, welcome culture, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. They have to say that across the um, uh, across the corporates, uh, the corporate piece, and of course it is incredibly uh, important topic which needs to be uh, addressed. However, if the employees, employee employees, are not advocates of this, and this is where the freely offered communications comes in, if as a wo I'm not a woman, but if you're a woman um, at an organisation and your firm is trying to tackle the gender diversity piece and you truly believe it then i would expect you would be happy to reshare that post into your own personal network saying you know what they're trying it's not great it's not perfect but the firm is certainly trying and i endorse this from the chief exec the managing partner the managing director whoever it might be yet all too often do we see that there's an uncomfortable silence in the room when we challenge boardrooms on this that no one's doing it now this could be one or two things it could be that um they don't believe it they don't believe the message that's that's being said so they're not going to share it it could be they don't understand how to share it it could be they don't think it's relevant for them to share it or important because the messages come out from the corporate machine at the top and that's uh, that's what it is or the what's in it for me why should I do this or permission that's a big one in all this in terms of the, uh, the the culture piece and the employee engagement and corporate culture as you know Ivy and Margaret's share <laughs> two very interchangeable and highly connected uh, highly connected things here is that I didn't know that I was allowed to post that 
I did not know that I was allowed to have a voice or be an advocate of the um, uh, of the organisation. So you've got to, if if you are either embarking on, you've got an employee advocacy program and it's it's struggling, you've got to kind of step take a step back and actually go to the users and a were they consulted in the first place, were they even consulted on which platform you were going to go with. And all too often do we see this in terms of a piece of technology, again, is, is given to an organization, but the actual day-to-day -day users were rarely asked during the process, well, we're thinking about using these platforms, which one would you like to, can we have your input in terms of how you work, will this fit within the way that you do things? Now, of course, sometimes you have to change your behaviors and habits to, to fit the new world order, but at least then they will feel engaged through the whole process because you've actually involved them in that decision-making process rather than going, hey, here's an employee advocacy tool. We're now all going to share lots of stuff on, on social media. If then then you haven't gone into them and got onto the got under the, the skin of the organization, got under the where their thoughts are, um, you're not necessarily going to expect them to, or you can't expect them to, uh, to deliver this. But then off the back of this comes kind of an interesting kind of there's multiple byproducts of this because if behaviorally the individual doesn't really understand how to use social or why they should use social they're unlikely to do it if they have the perception their uh, clients aren't on social then they're not going to do it which as we know today is highly likely to be wrong unless you're in very niche specific or highly regulated sectors uh, if their LinkedIn profiles don't reflect who they are, if they have a network where it's not relevant or and we see time and time again that they haven't connected or they aren't connecting to their client base or their prospects. So when it comes to them actually maybe wanting to engage and share stuff through a, a tool, and I'm not talking, talking about the freely offered communications, I'm talking about just curated through a tool and they repost it into their, um, into their network. If they are not connect to their client base, then with the greatest respect to those that are leading those programs, no matter what they tell you in terms of the internal engagement or the numbers that they get from these systems, it's a complete and utter waste of time because the whole point of doing this is for your client base to see you and see your content and your brand and remain front of mind, but then to sell through their networks so their sphere of influence, the people they are connected to, then see your content if hopefully when they... Um, uh, when they uh, they engage with it, if it's uh, if it's interesting content, so this all has to be considered before you even go down this route, because you could end up spending, in some cases, some of these tools are very very expensive, and all the time and effort and the content that is created and curated is all for for nothing. Let alone if you have a low level of employee engagement. You're on a hiding to nothing. It's never ever going to um, uh, going to work. Uh, and then that's a bigger question in terms of obviously the corp the overall corporate culture. Now that said, in terms of corporate culture, and I'll do a separate podcast on this. Uh, social can be extraordinarily powerful or an extraordinarily powerful way to actually bring an organisation together. And um, we are seeing that if HR can drive this, well, I mean, you may be kind of raising an eyebrow there or um, going, really, HR? But yes, uh, if HR can change the way it is perceived and use social to start to drive this culture, um, you can have huge success actually very quickly uh, across, across this and kind of leverage the whole um, virality or virality of how social works. But that is certainly for a, um, a, separate, uh, a separate podcast. But let's make the assumption that uh, they understand the what's in it for me. Uh, there is enough level of employee engagement and the culture is in the right place that people are happy to share and promote and, uh, and so on. We then fall into the next trap and we always, we even know before clients come to us and go, we've got an employee advocacy program, it's not really working. We go, yeah, we can, we, we can see that because sometimes you can actually see the links or the URLs. The next time you're on LinkedIn or Twitter, just actually start to look at the URL and you may see some different brand names of platforms in there, so you know it's come through the platform. Uh, you will probably see that nothing's been personalized. Uh, there's nothing worse, and I see this time and time again, you see the chief exec sharing something which looks personalized. You think, okay, and then you see the CFO, the CEO, um, head of HR, 
sharing exactly the same post and then it's just it's just lost all credibility and authenticity because it's just someone's just pushed a button and they're sharing on their behalf and they may not even know that that has actually been um, posted separate point we'll come to so what this can then do is actually just create laziness because the tool becomes the crutch and the person just goes okay well i've now done my bit i've just gone share 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 and if there's no thought process behind as to why am I doing this, what's the intent, the intent, sorry, I should say, behind why I'm sharing this post, why would my audience find this interest? Why should they read this? Because if that's not, if you're not personalizing the top three things in this, oh, have you thought about if you're in this sector, you should read this, etc. and so on, then all that's happening is you have 500, 200, 1,000, 10,000, 200,000 in some cases, employees just spamming their networks with all the same the same stuff and that's just like 21st century spam email which doesn't doesn't help anybody or help you and then you may get disillusionment because people aren't getting engagement so they're not going to bother doing it uh and coming back to the numbers and the metrics on this and i touched on this in my last podcast but i think it's a really really important point is that gamification has its place but if you're just gamifying for the sake of gamifying to try and drive people up the leaderboard what will happen, and this happens nine times out of ten, I see it, and I've witnessed this in my previous life and my previous organization, people focus on getting to the top of the leaderboard, not on the content that they're sharing and the impact that's having on them and their brand in the marketplace. So they're looking at the internal numbers just to get to the top of the leaderboard. People celebrate that, hey, this person's top of the leaderboard and they're really engaged and they're sharing lots of stuff. But what will be probably happening and if you've got an employee advocacy tool, you can see this happening on LinkedIn.com and on Twitter, but primarily it's been on LinkedIn.com. You can see this. You will note that these individuals are sharing everything, which then creates a really confusing message for their intended audience. Well, what are you a subject matter expert in? Because you seem to be sharing all kinds of random stuff. There's no real kind of context behind why it's being read. And the way the, and I'm going on about this, the way the algorithm is working, and the chances are it may not even be, it may not even be, be being seen anyway because the posts are too close together they're not getting engagement from their audience so LinkedIn is not even putting it into the news feeds because it doesn't think it's interesting and it wants interesting content in the news feeds of uh, its audience so it can sell eyeballs and um, uh, marketing ads uh, ad spend so I'm not saying don't gamify but I'm saying understand why you why you are gamifying and maybe break it down into component parts within each team and, and, and so on. But then, at, yes, the analytics you'll get from these employee advocacy tools is, is useful, but the most, the most the biggest the biggest litmus test in all of this is the type of engagement you're actually getting on the outside. So start interrogating people's LinkedIn posts. Uh, how many views have they had? Um, how many likes have they had? And I know I'm kind of going counterintuitive in terms of my my, my previous piece but just stick with me on this the reason I say that is because you need to make sure that it's the right people in the right companies and the right job titles so a view is an eyeball so it's gone through someone's news feed and LinkedIn gives you this, this insight but if you are posting lots of content and you've got enthusiastic advocates but it's landing in the wrong you know, the wrong sectors geographies types of organizations job titles and again this is a complete waste of time inwardly you may be getting some numbers saying really high engagement but outwardly, it's engaging in the wrong place. And you know, we always talk about fish where the fish are. There's no point fishing in the wrong pond if the people that are engaging with your post are never going to buy your products or services. It's a total and utter waste of time, and you're being misle misled by f false, in inverted uh, commas, numbers. So what you actually want to do or encourage, and this comes back to the freely offered communications piece, is encourage your employees to engage with third-party content. So go and leverage hashtags, go and follow your, your the companies that you work with, you're pitching to, engage with their content, engage with other people's content from HBR, from TechCrunch, from FT, from whoever it might be. We want to engage with that content. So this then pulls your audience into your newsfeed. So then they, they then can then see the third-party content blended with your own content, which then starts to drive the better engagement you get better engagement you'll get better win you'll get better return on investments on on everything and you'll move into the right uh 
the right places. And this is why if you've got an employee advocacy tool, and I've yet to meet an organization which does this, well, maybe one of my listeners will tell me otherwise, but if you enable third-party RSS feeds to come into your, your, your employee advocacy tools, it gives you far more ability to mix things up. It gives you far more ability to offer that, quote, that authentic, you know, f- as they refer to in this, um, this definition, freely offered communications. We want to start conversations. We just don't want, we don't want social media spam. This needs to be a conversation between people and LinkedIn rewards, likes and comments. And the only way we're gonna do that is by enabling your, your employees to actually have conversations, have a voice, be authentic, remain in the rules of engagement, common sense. If it feels wrong, it probably is. If you don't want it on the front page of whatever the main magazine, you know, FT, Wall Street Journal, don't care, don't do it. If you're unsure, ask, but give them some freedom that actually they can have a voice. And I think, no, I'll correct myself, I know that if you're able to do this, the return you'll get in terms of the right engagement, the right connections, the right type of inbound, I saw that, I read that, and I want to find out more. People be invited to speak at events. All sorts of things that can come from this. Uh, Save money on recruitment because you're getting direct hires coming through. Uh, Brand elevation into new markets, changing perceptions of what you were versus what you are now, all sorts of uh, uh, different things. But it all comes back to the what's in it for me as the employee, how engaged are they anyway, and what is the culture and the uh, culture and the, uh, of the uh, of the company. If those three things aren't in place, then employee advocacy is always going to fail, and no matter what type of technology you've got, it's not going to solve your problem. Uh, as ever thank you very much for uh, listening to this i hope you found it useful and insightful if you're thinking about employee advocacy you want to have a chat about uh, my um, experience and what we're doing to help organizations around that then you know feel free to connect with me uh, whatever it might be Uh, otherwise um, have a great day wherever you are in the world and uh, until next time